<clears throat> okay, so we, we have a question and answer session now. That, um, <clears throat> you have two or three questions, so um, if anybody still wants to write a question down and send it to the front, they may, or if they'd like just to ask um, verbally, you can do that also. So the question, first question is, um, yesterday, Prajan told us that 30 minutes worth meditation could easily be destroyed by idle chatter with friends. Doesn't that mean that talking about Dhamma with Prajan also destroys samadhi from meditation? Um, <clears throat> there, are, there are two or three points here. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with each point. Um, th this is something for you to observe um, what does and does not um, have a negative effect on the clarity of mind or the the brightness or the, the the peace of mind and indeed this is a way which in which can see um, how uh, teachings of morality in Buddhism um, differ from other teachings religions traditions um, so we are our criteria here is the um, <clears throat> the effect that actions and speech have upon our mind. So without going to um, a book or a list of right kinds of speech and wrong kinds of speech, we, we build up a, a kind of a database. You know, we know for ourselves what kind of speech um, clouds the mind or makes the mind feel kind of dirty and irritable afterwards. Um, <clears throat> when, when I teach um, the monks about this in, um, in a monastery, I would say, uh, after a conversation, uh, do you feel like going to meditate? Do you feel like going straight from that conversation onto your walking meditation path or, your, uh, or to go and sit on your cushion? If you feel kind of kind of restless and irritable and and um, agitated in your mind, and that's that's like the last thing you want to do right now, then that's a good indication that that was wrong speech. Um, so um, developing right speech um, is a very important practice and skills in communication. Um, could say that's one of the weak points so we can see um, certainly in Thai I don't know about overseas these days because I never lived there but but in terms of communications in institutions in schools in universities in in government departments and the um, faulty weak communication skills um, like a major issue I think and um, in Buddhism, you know, this uh, effort to develop more awareness and skill in how we communicate with one another is one um, area which is included in sila or sintam. So um, I think most people will, will find if there's a certain amount of spe right speech, let's say, um, talking about meditation, talking about um, issues like suffering and dealing with suffering, talking about real, real things um, with care and kindness, um, then after you finish speaking, your mind doesn't feel kind of weary and, and irritable and agitated. Quite on the contrary, it can further strengthen the mind. So last night, if you remember, we, we chanted the Mangala Sutta or Mongkon Sut about the different kinds of blessing in a human life. And so one was listening to the Dhamma, listening to teachings of the Buddha at um, opportune times. And the other one was Dhamma conversation hmm, at, the, at uh, appropriate times. So, you know, we spend a lot of time most people spend a lot of time chatting and talking, but you know how much of that talk uh, is gossip, and how much 
actually is um, uplifting to ourselves and to others? Um, that's a very good question to ask ourselves, I think, and also, you know, how it can increase the amount of, of nourishing kind of conversation without seeming like you know, like a, a Buddhist missionary or something, or trying to, you know, like say, tamma tammo, as we say in Thailand, but, but, uh, being able to, to, to deal with more, um, real issues in our life, um, in, in a constructive way, learning how to deal with the kinds of, um, insecurity and, um, discomfort that arise when we have to start talking about Feelings. I'm particularly uh, men more than women. It's a real difficult thing for most men to do to talk about their feelings, um, but it's <coughs> uh, but it's a skill. It's a life skill to develop. Um, the next question is um, from the same uh, person: Is how do we know we are progressing when meditating? Um, and in, in the brackets is progressing through the 16 different yarns or beyond. Um, so for those of you who don't know, yarn is a Thai um, <clears throat> pronunciation of a word called jnana in Pali. And in the commentarial tradition, um, I'm going to tell you what the commentarial tradition is. The, <clears throat> right from the time when the, the Buddha was teaching, there were monks commenting on them, or maybe even the Buddha gave a talk, and uh, afterwards somebody might come up to him and say, I didn't quite understand that, that part. Could you explain it a little bit more? So these explanations, which are not like formal talks, which were included in the, what we call the sutta, um, they formed like a body of commentary, so these are commentaries, explanations, um, interpretations from beginning from the Buddha himself and the great disciples, and then carried on um, for the next hundreds of years um, until a thousand years after the Buddha passed away, a great monk in Sri Lanka called Buddha Gosa collected and edited all of the commentaries that had been passed down over the centuries, um, and wrote this sort of the great book of uh, commentary in this Buddhist tradition called the Visuddhimagga, or the Path to Purity. And he also wrote comment commentaries and word-by-word -word, um, explanations for all of the suttas and all of the Vinaya texts, as to say the texts concerning the Buddha's discipline, and also the Abhidhamma, which is the kind of the psychology and, and um, systematization of the Buddha's teachings, which took place um, mostly after he died. So uh, we have the, the great commentaries um, written by Buddha Gosa, great monk or Buddha Gosa, in Sri Lanka, a, half, a thousand years after the Buddha passed away. He didn't write them himself. He collected and edited them. Um, and so um, this is a word you'll hear a lot about, the, the commentaries. So this is what we mean in the commentarial tradition. So if we start to study the Buddha's teaching, um, we can distinguish between what we call primary sources and secondary sources. So the primary source are the words of the Buddha himself, um, which we find in the suttas, in the discourses, in the collected talks that the Buddha gave, and in the Vinaya, all of the instructions concerning the monk's discipline and the, um, and the monastic order. Then, um, following that, we have the secondary sources, which are the commentaries. Now, even the commentaries, which were, uh, were edited, collected by Buddha Gosa, are not always so clear. And so then you have like a third layer and a fourth layer. So you have a, um, particularly um, that's created, uh, written in, in Burma. Um, so you have a, a third level, which is called the Tika, which is uh, the commentary on the commentary. 
and then you have a sub tika, which is the commentary on the commentary on the commentary. So it gets very complex. Uh, why I'm telling you all this, one for general knowledge, but also um, there tends to be a lot of confusion and uh, many of the things that you that you might find a little bit uh, confusing or difficult or um, even uninspiring, often they're not from the primary source, the words of the Buddha themselves, um, but they've appeared in the commentarial tradition. Now, when we come across things in the commentaries which are not in the sutta, what's our attitude? Well, the correct attitude is is to see to what extent they are in harmony with the original teachings. If they're in harmony, then they're a tool that we can use. But there may be occasions when they conflict with the original teachings for one reason or another. In that case, we give precedence to the primary source or the Buddha's words themselves. We call Buddha Vajna. So that's a long um, introduction to this phrase here, that 16 jnanas. So the 16 jnanas are, uh, are from a commentarial tradition. They are not words of the Buddha himself. And they are um, a convention or a teaching in the Burmese vipassana traditions um, in which they um, lay out um, levels of wisdom. You, know, you get stage one, stage two, stage three, all the way up to 16 stages. And if you go to on a retreat um, in one of these monasteries or uh, meditation uh, centers, they use these 16 levels. And they'll be asking you questions. Have you had this experience or that experience? And I say, oh, you're on this level or that level. So though that whole system of evaluating experience in meditation is not one used in Thai forest tradition at all. Um, and although we can see um, certain experiences and, and called knowledges or insights in those 16 insights which seem familiar or might be spoken about um, point by point, um, then... Um, the idea that everyone has to go through these stages or it's very, it's that systematic, um, is not one that I, I personally would share. Um, and I think that people's minds are, are, are quite different and people, so a progress in meditation takes many different forms. Anyway, the, the question is really is how do you know when you're really making progress in meditation? And it's a crucial question because the reason why many people start off in meditation with a lot of enthusiasm um, and then they get bogged down and they give up um, is usually because they don't think that they're making any progress. And it's like a lot of um, investment of time and energy for not very much result. Um, I, I would... Um, I would argue that that, that kind of um, attitude is based upon a lack of understanding about the meditative process and what it is exactly we're, we're doing when we're meditating. Like, um, I think we have to get away from this kind of goal-oriented thinking. Um, and this is precisely why meditation is, is such a um, powerful um, feature of our life is, is that um, we're no longer doing this in order to get that. You know, so in, in the world we might sort of get, do this degree in order to get this job or do this in order to get that reward. And our minds are very conditioned to think like that. But in meditation it's, it's putting the effort on the quality of the effort itself um, and learning how to deal with what comes up in meditation, it's a very um, uh, profound kind of problem solving, uh, we can say. Uh, so, um, if if it, one this is not the only way to look at meditation, but if it's a, one way of looking at meditation is pr as um, problem solving, um, 
then it's not that um, we want to um, get to a point where we don't have to solve any problems anymore. Um, but what we're, we're seeing is yet yeah, our problem-solving skills are developing every time we practice. So we're not taking progress to mean no more problems, but we mean increasing skill in dealing with problems. Um, and I, I, that's applicable to, uh, to, to meditation practice. We're learning about positive, menti- negative mental states, how to deal effectively with negative mental states, how to create, sustain positive mental states, um, how to understand the nature of the mind and body more clearly. So um, if, we, if we set up some kind of goal of peace and yanas and, and jhanas and all these things, then it can make it very stressful um, and a lot of worldly cravings come into the mind. So um, what I would say about progress in meditation is you, you don't look at it at a, you know, a, a, um, a session by session, a kind of assessment. Um, you have to look at it over a long period of time, six months or a year. Um, but also what you can notice is that if you are meditating well, if you like to use that term, it should be uh, having um, an effect on your conduct and your behavior. Because the thing that will, uh, the kinds of things that come up as you start to meditate more often, um, you know, more mindfulness, more calm, more patience, more tolerance. Um, but um, in particular, this um, appreciation of law of kamma, and that manifests as um, what we call hiri otapa. It's like a an intelligent or wise fear of um, uh, bad actions and uh, a a wise, informed shame of um, behaving and speaking badly. So you become a lot more careful about your actions and speech. That's a very good sign that that your meditation is going well. Um, The other is... Um, as you look at your mind more clearly and you see its strong points and its weak points and you start to be, develop more of an awareness of a big picture of your life than you would normally, um, then a lot of gratitude arises. Gratitude for your parents, gratitude for your teachers, um, and just seeing the whole web of um, causes and conditions that have led you to where you are today and and uh, when you see good qualities within you then so often you can see oh yes I got that from my mum or I got that from my dad or I got that you know I really developed this because of this teacher or that teacher so if you're looking for progress in meditation not just looking in terms of some special experiences um but your whole quality of life and your relations to other people is a a much more um, solid and dependable kind of gauge of progress. Uh, When I meditate, I used to see lights of various colors and other mind something things, but now I only sense the things happening externally and internally, breathing, pain, itching, and thoughts, I feel like I'm not making progress at all or that my jit is not being refined of gilet or gilesa at all. No, this is um, quite... Seeing lights um, is not an indication that you're making progress. Um, the, 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 it's not the content of what you're experiencing um, as much as your relationship to it. Um, if you get caught up and delighted by um, beautiful lights in your mind, it's not really, at the end of the day, anything different than becoming delighted by a uh, memory of some uh, piece of music that you like or, or some wonderful food that you like to eat. It's the, the, psychologically, the process is the same. Something arises in your mind 
and you just delight in it. And it is that delight in experience uh, which is the obstacle to meditation, not the experience itself. So um, lights and things are kind of exciting, aren't they? People like to think, oh, yeah, lights, uh, must, that must mean I'm doing something right. Um, but it's just, it's nothing, nothing very special. Well, my teacher was asked about this, and you say, oh, um, oh, I see all these lights, I want to see all these lights. He said, well, you, you want to see a lot of light, close your eyes and see a lot of lights, and just go to Bangkok, there's some far more to see. So it's not the point, that's not... Um, it's, I say it's like problem solving. How, how do you deal with pain? How do you deal with itching? How do you deal with thoughts? How do you deal with all these things that arise? This is the work of, of meditation. Being able to free ourselves from grasping onto those things and being uh, affected by them or suffering because of them. So th- this question is in Thai, so I'm going to leave this one. Uh, it can be for the Thai session. Um, my friend who does not have much background knowledge about Buddhism Ask me the purpose of Gantu Sinbad, or keeping eight precepts. What answer would I give him? Well, um, I did um, make a few remarks about Sila last night, but I'll, I'll repeat them, expand upon them now. Um, in, in most um, philosophies and religions, particularly those um, that believe in a god or gods. <clears throat> then um, morality or the the moral code um, is believed uh, to have been established by that ultimate supreme authority, and it's enforced by a system of reward and punishment. So if you you do what um, God or the Supreme Being wants you to do, you're obedient um, to his wishes, then you get a reward. If you don't, you get punished. So when you have that idea of a, a single Supreme Being laying down a moral code to which human beings have to be obedient, then there, there's the possibility of... Um, well, maybe you could change his mind. You know, it's like uh, in a dictatorship. If all the power is with one figure and you, maybe you have some connection, then maybe you can persuade the all-powerful figure not to punish you when you do something wrong. Um, so uh, then you have this whole system of petitionary prayer, asking uh, for uh, to be let off something and you won't do it again, for instance. Um, but in, in, in Buddhism, uh, the, the basis of the moral code is the law of kamma, law of cause and effect, that actions of body, speech, and mind accompanied by volition or intention, um, have results which, um, are, uh, related to or are which harmonize with the intention. So the, the so most basic expression of this idea is tam di dai di, tam chua dai chua. Um, so the, um, the practice of sila and, uh, or in, uh, in Buddhism, um, is a training or an education of our conduct. So we don't have to refer to a higher being at all. We start off very simply saying, what are the elements? What are the characteristics of a healthy family or a healthy community? You know, what are the kinds of, what's the bottom line, you know, for uh, a family or a community to live together and happily? So one of the uh, the main 
points that I, I made um, last night was that um, safety. We have to feel safe. If you feel that you're in danger, that somebody around you might uh, physically or verbally abuse you at any time, yeah, you can't feel really happy there. It's impossible. Um, you need to be able to trust each other. You need a sense of mutual respect. Um, so if that, if that is the case, then um, how c- practically speaking, what can we do to create this kind of healthy community in every, which everyone feels safe, they feel warm and, and appreciated, um, they feel a sense of mutual respect and kindness. What, what can we do to be able to create that kind of community? So the Buddha said the first step is that um, if all the people in the community, the family, um, make a commitment uh, to uh, refrain from or to not do certain things, not speak in certain ways, um, and take that as the standard, then um, that feeling of um, safety and um, mutual respect and appreciation will arise. So we can see that this is not um, overly idealistic. We're not saying we should all love each other and forgive each other and be kind to each other and then everything will be fine. Because we can't make that kind of promise. You know, you can't promise um, that you won't ever get irritated or lose your temper with someone you love. Um, there's always going to be um, things going on, some misunderstanding, some uh, hurt feelings, some anger, some jealousy, all these kinds of things. And we can't just decide not to feel all those emotions because we want to live together happily. But what we can say is that even though um, every now and again I might lose my temper with you, I might get angry, um, I will never abuse you. I will never abuse you physically. I will never abuse you verbally. This is my promise to you. You see? So uh, when you do that, then that's a good basis for a healthy community, isn't it? Because it's practical. Um, and it's, it's something that we can do. You cannot, unless you're, uh, you've developed your mind to a very high degree, you've uh, reached one stage of enlightenment, you can't promise that you won't get angry with somebody. You can't promise that you won't ever want to or think about hitting somebody. Uh, but you're saying, even if I really f- feel really violent and angry, I won't. That's my decision. That's my promise. That's my commitment. So the, um, these first five precepts um, are the basis for healthy, happy um, communities, families, communities, societies. Um, so instead of looking at the five precepts in the negative, oh, you don't do this, you don't do that, you know, you feel like you're just missing out on so much, these are actually the building blocks these are the foundation for the kind of families and community, that life that we all want. Now, the question was about the eight precepts. Now, the eight precepts um, are um, taken on by practicing Buddhists on special occasions. Um, traditionally, um, Buddhists would take the eight precepts on the one Prat day, so every um, eighth day of the moon cycle and every 15th day. So in, in one month, one lunar month of four days. Or some people might just make the, um, the uh, aditan or, or make a resolution to take eight precepts on the two, um, uh, the, uh, the dark moon and the full moon days. The one prat yai. So once a month, uh, 
sorry, twice a month or four times a month, um, then lay Buddhists would take the eight precepts. Uh, but the rest of the time, the five precepts are considered to be sufficient for lay Buddhist uh, living in the world. Now, if you look at the extra precepts in the eight precepts um, form, you'll see that they don't relate to good and bad. You know, it's not like really bad kamma. You know, you're not going to go to hell if you eat in the evening, obviously, or if you watch a movie, or you, or you put some makeup on, or listen to a uh, listen to uh, music. Um, it's nothing to do with um, basic morality and basic quality of life in communities. But these are um, renunciation precepts. That means that we just um, every now and again, by taking a precept, we have a form in which we just take ourselves out of our usual way of life and way of living. Um, first advantage is it frees up some time. You know, we're all these days, um, we may have more money, more wealthy, but we're time poor. So you may, most of, most people, most of you, Make a choice um, and uh, be willing to be time poor um, in order to be um, money or possession um, rich or wealthy to one extent or another. But given that um, people are very poor, they don't have um, much time, then the eight precepts is a way of freeing up some time. So you're not cooking food, eating food, digesting food in the evening. Um, when you're not watching TV or you're on your uh, computer or um, receiving, sending messages, just coming out of that whole world of social media for one evening um, or one, one day, one night, um, it gives you time to... Um, meditate, to read some Dhamma book, and to do those, um, to uh, fulfill the kind of spiritual practices which you find uh, you rarely have time for in your daily schedule. So it's a break from that kind of daily madness. Um, it's also a good check to see how healthy your relationship to those things are, because it's so easy for there to be a, like a drip, 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 um, increase in all these things until they become way out of balance. And so to, as a check to where, how, how balanced your life is, um, these eight precepts, um, just help you to stand back. And by going without those things for just one day and one night, then you see what happens. Do you feel really lost and, um, irritated? and lonely, and uh, upset, and depressed. Um, if those kind of things happen, then, then that's a good signal um, that you, you, you lost some balance in your relationship with those things and need to um, establish some, some new standards for yourself, some new boundaries. So the eight, the eight precepts, the, the um, addition of the sixth, seventh, eighth, and the change of the third precept uh, to a brahmacharya, to celibacy, standing back from all the usual worldly activities a little bit and being able to assess, um, to uh, check the balance, um, and also to free up time for um, some specific spiritual practices. Okay, <clears throat> one or two more. Uh, what is the purpose to wear amulets, as well as the reason why people buy these amulets for high prices? <laughs> Good question. Um, well, originally, um, I think the, you know, 
the original purpose is that these things are reminders, you know, like just as Christians might wear a cross and Buddhists will wear an amulet or a Buddha medallion just to remind you of your values and your commitment to Buddhist path. Um, unfortunately, um, these uh, amulets and Buddha medallions, all these things have just been absorbed into the um, capitalist, uh, mercantile, commercial um, <laughs> uh, jungle. And now, so now they are um, traded, really. So although you still use this kind of polite language, we say we chow, you don't buy them, you rent them and whatever, but but uh, really um, looking at the intentions of the people involved, you know, oh, oh, you've got one of those, oh, wow, you can get like a 100,000 baht for one of those. Have you got one of these? These are even... So it becomes very kind of worldly, and the fact that the object itself is a... Um, is a uh, representation of the Buddha or of a great monk is really incidental um, to what's really going on, which is just buying and selling. So it's um, um, for most, in most cases, not in every case, uh, you know, it's become a very corrupted um, uh, hobby, practice, uh, and interest, and um, and it's not just in Thailand these days. Um, uh, been in, <laughs> go to China more regularly now, and, and um, Thai uh, amulets a huge, big business in China, in Shanghai, and also in Singapore, and so it's everywhere. So we're almost there. This will be. Um, So this is a, actually a big, uh, big question, but I'm going to give a um, reasonably short answer. What are the main differences between Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism? So I, I mean, there are whole books written about this, so it's not something that can be explained so easily. But um, after the, the Buddha passed away, there were Buddhist communities um, in different parts of India and with communications um, so poor in those days, uh, inevitably um, the, um, the personalities and the personal practices of the leaders of different communities um, started to influence their interpretations of the teachings or their, what they emphasized um, and then there's the role of scholarship and so on and so forth. So you had this gradual diversification. Um, and although it wouldn't be right to call these sects because they didn't sort of feel that they were competing or that they were in conflict, they were like different schools, if you like. Um, and then they could be grouped into um, two main groups. One main group we could call the conservative group um, and then the other group will be called the liberal group so of the conservative group um, some 20 different schools um, dwindled down eventually till all that's left today um, is the Theravada school which survived because it moved down to the south of Thailand excuse me, India and then over into Sri Lanka, and um, the Isle of Sri Lanka became a refuge and protected it. And then from Sri Lanka, Theravada Buddhism spread into Thailand and um, Burma and, and um, uh, into Southeast Asia. So, uh, and Thailand today is what we call predominantly a Theravada Buddhist country. Now, Mahayana... Um, Buddhism is not a single school. Um, it's uh, the name for the group of schools. And so uh, we can, uh, the term we would use is, it's an umbrella term. So there isn't just a, a thing called Mahayana Buddhism, which you can compare with Theravada Buddhism. Um, there are many different schools 
of Mahayana Buddhism, um, some of them um, more similar to Theravada Buddhism than others. Now, Mahayana Buddhism are what I call the liberal um, uh, group, and that is to say they were a lot more willing to adapt to uh, different cultures as they spread out throughout the world. And so the, the Mahayana schools um, were uh, absorbed a lot more influence from the religions and cultures to which they spread than the conservative group, and particularly Theravada, which um, his whole uh, ideal is to care for the original teachings and not to allow them to be distorted or corrupted. So the Mahayana, because they were that more flexible, then they spread a lot further than Theravada and spread up into um, northwestern Asia. So a lot of those um, Stan countries, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, all those were, were Mahayana Buddhists. And indeed, Afghanistan, Afghanistan actually was more of a, one of the Theravada um, schools or um, in the same group as Theravada. But the Iran, present day Iran, uh, was um, Mahayana for quite some time. There are still remnants of, of um, Mahayana temples in, to be found in the desert in Iran. Um, and it, of course, it spread to Tibet and to China and to Korea and to Japan. And so a China is a good example where it, it um, in China it met the uh, Confucianism and Taoism and so was very much influenced by them. And then there were changes to be made because of climate, changes to be made because of um, surrounding conditions. And so Buddhism evolved and changed and... Um, each school developed its own set of scriptures. And when they did this, the, the Mahayana were at a disadvantage in that they, um, their teachings didn't have the same weight as the, the um, Pali teachings, which were the original Buddha, Vajana, Buddha word. And so it became um, a custom, it became believed that the Mahayana suttas, which were written much later, 100 years, 200 years or more later, even more, um, were in fact, um, did in fact come from the Buddha, but the Buddha gave them to the, to the devas, to, to the tevada, or to the payanak, um, to look after until people were born who could understand them. So this was how they got round this um, uh, criticism that you just made this up and you say it's the Buddha. They say, oh, it was the Buddha, but he gave it to the devas and, and uh, then we got it from the devas, you see. So, um, so there are many, um, many similarities and it's worth noting there's never been kind of religious war in Buddhism between this this group and that group. Everybody gets on fine. And if I go to China or I go to Tibet or uh, meet monks of other traditions who are just like um, brothers and, and you know, all, all feel we're the same same group. Um, so the, the differences um, of philosophy and of, of particularly of meditation practices um, at least for monks, don't feel so significant. But in the, I think in the Mahayana groups, you can see a lot more um, influence of, um, like a lot more praying and uh, devotional practices than in the Theravada. Um, yeah, it's a really big topic, so I, I think we're a bit short of time. If anybody wants to ask something specifically about those uh, differences, then um, we can go into it in a bit more detail. But I, I, I feel very 
happy that there's kind of big diversity of teachings and practice, but it's all feels like it's all one big, big family really, and there's never been bad feeling between the different Buddhist groups as there is tends to be between uh, different sects in most religions. Okay, so um, we're going to have a short meditation session now um, before we end at midday. So we've got 20 minutes, so if you'd like to...